I was standing here thinking that all across Atlanta and other parts of the world, as you watch live streams, uh, programs, events of other churches, not all churches, but many of the churches that are held in very high regard and at times so uh, rightfully so, but what I want you to know is today, the only paid people that were on this platform are those who are actually on staff, which was just a few of the whole. Most all of our music ministry team are all volunteers, instrumentalists and others, and we are just blessed at Salem to have many people who use their gifts and talents without pay to come and to play and to sing, and what a blessing that is. Amen? Uh, why don't you just show your appreciation for them today? And, and I encourage you, uh, Brian tells me oftentimes, I said, man, they sound good. He said, they're all paid. Uh, every person on the, on the platform uh, at this church or that church. And I was just thinking, thank God for those people that serve uh, without pay. They have other jobs, other means to support themselves, but they come here and they participate and to uh, produce a sound like that to the praise and glory of God. Uh, is a blessing and I'm so thankful and thank you to all of you that serve in any way whether you're taking temperatures during the coronavirus uh, whether you're serving to demolish a part of the Keys Ferry campus or begin to rebuild it very soon we're thankful for you and uh, whatever part you play but I want us today uh, to join ourselves together on the proving ground of faith in Exodus uh, chapter 15 now when you look at a text like Exodus 15 in the latter part, uh, verses 22 through 27, you might ask yourself the question, what, what is there that speaks to me from the Lord in this text? Well, there's a great deal in this uh, simple text. And in fact, we could spend about six months on these five verses alone, believe it or not. And I thought about today breaking this into a three-part series and then uh, doing some more, but uh, time will not allow us to do that. But there is so much, so much rich teaching and, and wisdom in these words, and let us celebrate them today together. The proving ground of faith. Verse 22 says, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah, which means bitter. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, a piece of wood, and he threw it into the water and the water became sweet. There the Lord made a decree and a law for them. And there he tested them. And he said, if you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, and if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And then they came to Elam, where, they were, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped near, there near the water. So what we have today is a journey to the proving ground. Now let's just back up in our minds for a little while in the story of the Exodus. For 400 plus years, God's people are held in bondage and captivity in the land of Egypt. You remember Joseph uh, went into the land of Egypt being sold into slavery by his brothers. Uh, they had it out for him, sold him off. Joseph, at the end of his story, he rose up to be second in command under Pharaoh. Uh, and as he was there and he took care of his brothers, he said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Then Exodus says that uh, after Joseph's generation had died, there arose to the throne another king, another Pharaoh, who knew not Joseph and his people. And then he began to oppress the Israelites and to put them into captivity and bondage and use them as slaves to build bricks and to build the empire. And so they went along groaning and crying out to the Lord for help. And God sent a deliverer in the person of Moses. And Moses came to them. 
And Moses would speak with his brother Aaron to Pharaoh. And you remember that there were ten plagues brought upon Egypt because Pharaoh would not let the people out of the land. And so God began speaking to him, uh, at, to Pharaoh. And he hardened, Pharaoh hardened his heart more and more. The first of the plagues, if you remember, was God turning the Nile to blood. Moses touched it with the staff, and instead of being water which was drinkable, it became blood. And the people of Egypt groaned out because they had no drinking water. And it says all along the Nile they were digging to find water that they might could drink. And so it's interesting that the text today deals with water as it concerns the Israelites. So finally, after the tenth, when God said to his people, bring a little lamb into your home, and on the fourteenth at twilight, uh, you are to take the life of the lamb, apply its blood around the door frame of your house, and that night the death angel will pass by, and wherever the blood is, the angel will pass over, and no death will come to that home, whether human or animal. And so then that took place. And then the Egyptians gave spoils uh, to the Israelites, great wealth. And then they went out of Egypt coming south and then would be at the Red Sea, would cross the Red Sea. The waters divided, the land was dry, and they found themselves on the other side of the sea where we find in chapter 15, Moses creates, uh, writes a song, and they burst out in spontaneous praise to God for what he had done to deliver them. Three days later, we find ourselves in Marah, the place of bitterness. Now, let me just show you on a map where all this transpired, just for a little visual. All right, this is the uh, Sinai Peninsula. This is the Red Sea. Uh, you have, for those on the other side, the Red Sea and the Sinai Peninsula. This is Egypt up in this area. And then over here, you have Israel up just above this area. Egypt, uh, Israel's here. And so what happened is they came down out of the cities of Egypt and came along to the edge of the Red Sea where there's a massive beachhead here. And they crossed on dry land having a hard time holding this still today. They crossed on dry land, and when they got here, instead of going on up to Israel, God led them to the south, and they came down into the wilderness of Shur. And as they got there, they came to Marah, uh, Mount uh, Sinai is down here. And so as they were in this area right here, this is what took place. They went three days without water. It has been said that a human body can live three days with no water, and then it gets into trouble with dehydration. But when they are coming along, somebody points out, there's a body of water. We're going to be able to drink now. But when they get there, the water is bitter. So they're on the trail, the path, to the proving ground. And on the way, as they're going south, they find an obstacle. There is no water to drink. Sometimes there's not much time between our singing God's praise for something he's done on our behalf and the next sorrow that comes our way. They came to Marah, the place of bitterness, and they couldn't drink the water. It must have seemed like a cruel joke that they were experiencing. But I want you to understand as they were coming along that path, they were right in the center of God's will. They did not go there on their own. They were being led there. Verse 22 says, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. Moses led Israel. The verb is in the causative, which means Moses uh, was intentionally leading there, and the implication is that God led Moses to lead them there. So as they were going on their way, and they came to Merah, they were not there by a mistake. They were not there by happen chance. They were not there because of Israel's bad luck, and they were certainly not there because somebody couldn't read the map. They got to this place by the providence and the wisdom of God who was leading them by a cloud and a pillar of fire. 
That had not changed. God was leading them. Even though it wasn't written there, we know the whole of the Exodus, and God was with them the entire time. A pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God led them, and Moses followed him. They were exactly in the place that God wanted them by his unfailing providence. And sometimes when you and I are on the trail of life and we find ourselves in the most bitter of places, it is because God has us there for a reason and God allows us to be there for a reason. And so these folks were right in the center of God's will. And he was leading them and he in fact led them to the bitter water. And so as they came there, there was a purpose. And the purpose for going down the trail to the proving ground was to end up at the proving ground for the purpose of testing. God was going to test their faith, not with the desire to defeat them, but with a desire to strengthen them. Testing in our lives often follows triumph. I think of the prophet Elijah. It's a blessing to stand on Mount Carmel in Israel and think about the strength of Elijah as the Lord strengthened him and how he took on the 850 false prophets and was victorious. And then shortly thereafter, one woman by the name of Jezebel was used to test him and it brought Moses, excuse me, Elijah to a place of near depression. He was in despair. He was, woe is me. And God came to him and taught him what it was like when you're physically, emotionally, and spiritually drained, what a man needs to do to be refreshed in the Lord. And so we must remember that testing often follows triumph. Testing by the Lord or temptation of the devil. But it seems like at this point in their journey, they have forgotten something. They've forgotten about the plagues possibly because they're grumbling. They've forgotten about the fact they've been delivered. They were grumbling. Maybe they've forgotten somehow in just a few days the miracle of the Red Sea and what they saw accomplished there. Uh, they had forgotten. They had forgotten that the Lord was in absolute and complete control of the nations of the earth, including them. And they also forgot that the Lord, is being the master of life, is Lord over the good days and the bad days. If you think about Matthew's gospel, how does it end? It ends with the Great Commission. But the Great Commission ends with a great promise. And that great promise is this. I, Jesus, will be with you all the days. I will be with you always. That means Jesus is with us in the glorious days, and it means he's with us in the difficult days. It means sunshine. It means storm. The Lord said, I will be with you always, all the days, literally, and he was with the Israelites all the days. Pillar of cloud, pillar of fire. He was with them. But just as difficulty had come uh, in their lives, so it comes in ours. And you'll find many people, when life is bitter, wringing their hands, hanging their heads in despair, and worrying and anxiety ridden, we forget that the same God who's in control of the days of joy is in control in the days of heartbreak. Do you know why God brought them to the place? I've told you, to test them. It was a place where God was going to prove them. Now, if you know anything about automobiles, you know that before they're uh, brought to the dealership and put on the showroom floor, that they go through a, a testing period that's called a proving period. And the, each of the major automobile manufacturers have what are called proving grounds. And so General Motors has a proving ground. Uh, they run cars on uh, very difficult tracks. They use them in different climates and, and terrain. And they basically try to see if they can wear this car out if it's faulty in any regard. Suspension, uh, electrical, and everything. Safety measures. You've seen them take the, the cars and put them on a track and it runs head on into a wall and the dummies are inside to determine how the car crumbles in a crash. That is the proving ground. The the purpose is to see if that make and model car and the design thereof is able to stand the test, to be proven worthy of being sold and put on the road. 
They are proving an automobile. So they're testing the automobile for the purpose of seeing it, if it is good for the consumer. Now, look at Israel. God, unknowns to them, was testing them at the place of the bitter water. And so the Lord uses the proving ground of the Mara bitter water to build new faith and trust in him in their lives. He tested them. It means to train, to prove. So the Lord proved that the people could in fact learn to follow him and his instruction for their own well-being if they put their trust in him. He didn't test them because he didn't know their hearts. He tested them so that they would know their hearts, willing to wander, willing to grumble and be disobedient. God knew them, but he wanted them to know themselves. So the Lord tests them to encourage spiritual growth and to bring out the best in them. And he wants to bring out the best in us. But the devil, on the opposite side, tempts us to bring out the worst in us and to encourage spiritual immaturity and spiritual satisfaction in the shallow things. But God wants to stretch us. Warren Wiersbe said, the attitude that we take toward our difficulties determines which direction in life we will go. For what life does to us depends on what life finds in us. When we live a life of faith, the circumstances of life will find in us a life of faith and that we are willing to stretch and grow uh, with the storms and the strain of life. In places where the winds blow regularly, the tree's root system are all the deeper because the tree and the creation knows it has got to meet the match of the climate. And so God wants his people to pass the test and grow. But if, we, if in unbelief we complain and disobey God's word, we know we'll fail the test and remain immature. So you come along the trail to the proving ground you find yourself tested in the proving ground of life. And for all of us, it's different places. But there's the teaching that takes place in the proving ground. What is it? The teaching of the proving ground is that we would trust God's hailing hand and live by faith in him. <clears throat> Last week, I shared with you about the lyrics of the song that Moses wrote. If you did not... Uh, we're not here last week or weren't watching online, uh, we can praise God for his gracious hand and his favor upon us. We can praise God for his guarding hand, for his guiding hand that he leads us, his ghastly hand that he terrorizes the enemy, terrorizes those that oppose his people, and his glorious hand that God glorifies himself. And so God, in this early part of the Exodus story, we've been seeing him as a warrior God, that God is strong and mighty, and he can, he can destroy and crush any army that opposes him, that God is a mighty warrior who comes to deliver those who are held captive. He is a warrior. But when we come to this text, we find that God is a healer. He is a healer. So here we find the warrior God becoming the God who is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals thee. And so as we look at that, look down in verse 25. The people had grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? And then Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a piece of wood and he threw it into the water and the water became sweet. So as we look at that portion of scripture, here they are at this spot. Hemmed in again by progressing dehydration. And if they did not get water, they would begin to die. Dehydration would lead to death for them in the desert. But God, it says there, if we read on uh, in verse 25, there the Lord made a decree and law for them and there he tested them and he said if you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes if you pay attention to his commands keep all of his decrees I will not bring on you any of the diseases that I brought on the Egyptians for I am the Lord your God who heals you 
And then they came to Elam where the, there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees and they camped there near the water. So God becomes for them in this moment Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who healeth thee. If Israel had never faced this bitter time, if they'd never faced the bitter water, they would not have known this aspect of God's character, the Lord who heals thee. Just as though, just like Job, if he had never lost everything, he would not know that God is one who restores all things. Just like Lazarus, had he not died and been raised from the dead, he would not have known what it was like to live in the resurrection life with joy. Mary and Martha would not have known that Jesus was the resurrection and the life as soon as they did. You remember Jesus said, listen, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me, though he were dead like your brother, yet shall he live again. They would not have known the joy of seeing their brother raised had they not first known the grief of seeing him buried. What this text teaches us is that the Lord uses the bitter episodes of life to reveal himself more fully to us and to teach us to trust him more so by faith. The key to learning and trusting the Lord is by not kicking, but to rest in his power and allow him to have his way in our lives. So what do we learn on the proving grounds? There they are. Now let me just mention to you what takes place. Moses, it says, cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. Moses said, Lord, help us. Help me. And the Lord shows him a tree. Now in that is implied the fact that not only did he show them the tree, he told them what to do. He told and showed Moses what to do with the tree or led him by faith. And so this is a mighty miracle, but there's not much said about it like there was about the crossing of the Red Sea because you and I should be in a pattern of understanding that this is the work of the majesty from on high. And so he takes a tree and he throws it into the water and it becomes sweet, drinkable. So what should we learn about at the proving grounds, at the testing place? First, we need to learn about ourselves as they learned about themselves. They were living for self. Most every problem, every sin that you and I commit, every difficulty that we face when not inside the will of God is because we are living for self. Instead of making decisions to glorify the Lord and for the edification of our families and those around us, we choose to uh, seek pleasure. We seek to pursue things that will satisfy us. And so we choose to live for self. And not only is that destructive for us, but it's destructive in the lives of other people oftentimes. And so they were living for self, but they were also living by sight. They're looking around. There's no water. There's bitter water. And so all th along this journey, we're seeing these people are living by sight and not by faith. Another thing we see about them that is evident oftentimes in us is they were never satisfied. Uh, when they had the mighty deliverance of God lead them out of Egypt, they came down to the banks or to the edge of the Red Sea, and there they started complaining wanted to take Moses out because he'd led them down there. They crossed over the sea. They sang their song of praise, and now they're grumbling. They're never satisfied. You ever met somebody who is never satisfied, no matter what you do for them? And by the way, parents, you can create that in your child if you're not careful by giving them everything they want from the early day and they think they can always get something else. It's a good thing to sometimes, like God says to us, to say no. For those of you with little children, I would encourage you to use that word often. Kids don't need everything that the neighbor's kids have uh, to su su succeed and do well. In fact, they would probably do well to not have everything the neighbor has. But in the testing ground, they've learned some lessons about the Lord. What they learn about the Lord? First of all, he is aware of our needs. God knows what we need. 
So the Lord Jesus said in his uh, prayer uh, that we know to be the Lord's prayer, what did he say? Give us this day our daily what? Jesus knew that God knew what he needed. And so he was saying, Father, give to us that which we need to be sustained today. God is aware of our needs. He knows our emotional needs, our physical needs, and our spiritual needs. He is aware of our needs. And secondly, he is able to meet our needs. God is abundantly able to meet any need that you and I have. In Philippians, Paul said this to the church. He said, my God who has met my needs and taught me to be content in all circumstances, he can meet your needs and supply all of them according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He said to the Ephesians, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask of him or think according to the power that works in him be all praise and glory. He knew that God was able to do more. The psalmist said, every beast of the forest is mine, speaking of God. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God says, I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in the field is mine. All life is mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, for the world is mine and all that it contains. Shall I eat of the flesh of bulls or drink of the uh, blood of male goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High, he said. But then he said this, call upon me, it's the Lord speaking, in your day of trouble and I will rescue you and as a result you will honor me. So not only does God know our need, not only is God able to meet our need, but God has already in his perfect plan provided for our need. Long before we get to the point of need, he's already got the provision for it. Years before Israel arrived at Merah, God caused a seed to germinate and a tree to grow by the bitter waters. God knew that Israel would be coming down that pathway to the proving ground. God chose that place to be the proving ground. And so when he shows to Moses a tree, you have to understand the tree did not appear in a day. The tree grew from a germinated seed up until the point that it was usable for this purpose. And Moses throws it into the water. And by doing so, the tree became an implement of those people's salvation in that season of Israel's journey. But then also... In reading about this text, I came across one commentator who was using a scientist and a person who understood nutrition to say that most likely in that region of the world, when the, world word, uh, the water became sweet, that there was also a high content of magnesium and calcium in that very water in that place. And said that God, in fact, used that to heal the people of their diseases. Now, you have to follow along this thought. The Egyptians had many illnesses that are known in their land. And the children of Israel come out, cross the sea. They're going into a period of time that they shouldn't have been going into, but they did because they weren't willing to go into the land 40 years of wandering. And so God is preparing them for it. So if you take magnesium in large quantities and calcium, it accomplishes something. So what does magnesium and calcium do? Together, calcium makes the muscles contract and magnesium makes them relax. Together, they regulate the heartbeat. And so these people, as they were being dehydrated, they needed calcium and magnesium. And if this rider is correct and they received it from that water, their heartbeat would be regulated. It also, magnesium helps one to sleep it helps, and then calcium is bone health. The magnesium uh, makes muscles relax. And so today, if you're going to have something, and uh, you know, here it is in the sermon, a colonoscopy, what do they often give you? Magnesium citrate. And what that does is it relaxes the muscles and everything is washed out and all becomes clean. So what the writer said was this. These diseases they brought out with them that would have been hiding out in the intestinal tract, 
the sweet water could have possibly cleansed them and set them on their way with a new beginning. Heart beat strong, and the reality is God is able to meet the needs even by water at times. But let's go back to that tree. That tree, by the bitter water, became an implement of salvation. And you say, well, how so? Folks, if they didn't have water, they would have died. Our bodies are made up of a high percentage of water. And without water, you cannot survive. You can go without food a pretty long period of time, but you cannot go without water but for a few days. And so that water became salvation for them, if you will. It became living water for them. And so the tree was an implement of their salvation. Fast forward to the time of Jesus. Somewhere, sometime, a seed germinated and a little tree began to grow somewhere outside of Jerusalem. And at some point, the Roman government ended up with portions of multiple trees outside the Damascus Gate on a hill called Golgotha. And three patibulums, that's the cross, that's the upright, the cross beam of a cross. The patibulums were stacked inside the praetorium where Pilate ruled over Antonia's fortress. And on a certain day, someone selected one of those pieces of timber and put it on the shoulder of Jesus Christ who took it out to Calvary and that piece of wood, that tree became an implement of salvation for you and me. See, God didn't just plan before the foundations of the earth that Jesus would die. He planned how he would die, crucified on a Roman cross made of wood. And how do we get wood by a tree growing somewhere on the earth? Jesus died on an implement of salvation. By his blood, we are healed. But on the cross, the implement of salvation, God used another piece of wood to deliver his people. And just so that you can make the uh, correlation, when Jesus was asked by the woman at the well in Sychar in Samaria, she said, how is it that you can give to me living water? For the well is deep and you have nothing to draw with. And he said to her, I am living water. And he who drinks of me will never, ever thirst again. The, the drink of water that I give bubbles up into eternal life. Never thirsting again, we will be satisfied. God knows what we need before we get there. And so the next step along the way, they need food and the Lord provides it. And Jesus said, remember the manna that fell? What is it? It's manna. It's bread from heaven. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. So as we come to the proving ground, we can either fail the test of faith or we can be strengthened by faith in the Lord. And then in verse 27, it says this, and I just flat failed to mention it in the last two services. So if you're watching at home and you were here earlier, hear this. Then they came on down to Elam where there were 12 springs, fresh water, and there were 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. There was enough for God's people. 12 tribes of Israel, 12 springs. There were 70 palm trees. There were 70 elders leading the people of Israel. God supplies what his people need. And they camped near the water. And then in chapter 16, we begin to see the manna and the quail that were provided by the Lord. Let's pray together.